are underway. I thought you said you were going, Tony. Oh, he's gone now. Tony. Oh, okay. um, hello and welcome to all of our participants, it says in the bottom. Um, my name's Paul O'Neill, uh, the guy who was uh, the positive pit stop. Here he is. It's Tony, my partner in crime. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Yes. I hope you are all doing mightily well. I completely forgot it was St. Patrick's Day. Um, but yeah, hello and welcome. And uh, this is the fifth positive pit stop. Where are the weeks going? Um, which is crazy, but also awesome as well. So as most of you know, it's a one hour show where people can meet, they can chat. You can all chat, you can all meet. Um, you can all just be positive and discuss an aspect of mental health with um, myself and Tony, the hosts, and also our star guests, who we will speak about in a second. Um, but it's a great place to be, and it's fantastic that I keep seeing um, a lot of the same faces, especially Robert Marsh, who looks like something out of um, Stacy's mom has got it going on. Um, the video for that. Anyway, um, so we had an amazing show last week with Stevie Brogan, who is an absolute hero and a legend and a best, best friend of mine. Love him to bits. Um, so fantastic that Steve come and shared some um, insight to British Superbikes and other aspects of racing and uh, coaching. Um, but we're going to stay on two wheels. But before we introduce our guest, I uh, just want to say it's been a pretty uh, dark um, few days for, for motorsport in general with the passing of uh, Murray Walker, who for one was somebody for me personally who I never give enough credit to that kind of got me into my career because people always ask me who my hero was and who got me into motorsport. And I'll just tell you quickly, I, I always used to say Nigel Mansell, 1986, round the outside of uh, PK for the lead at Silverstone, crowd go wild, amazing. What I've learned as I've got older, it actually wasn't Nigel Mansell. Nigel Mansell was a byproduct of what Murray gave me, and that was the story and the pictures he painted and uh, the amazing nature of his commentary. So that's why I'm probably here today. So um, an amazing loss. I think it's been fantastic what's been said, what's been shown, what's been shared on social media. It's been absolutely uh, amazing. So, yeah, for me personally, Murray Walker, massive hero of mine, um, but also Sabine Schmitz as well, who sadly passed away at the age of 51 today um, after a bit of a battle with cancer. Um, and, you know, first lady to, to win uh, the Norse life 24 hours, the Nürburgring 24 hours, an absolute trailblazer uh, of a woman um, in motorsport for four wheels. Um, I thought it was, um, you know, a really sad loss the last few days. So, um, yeah, just wanted to share that with you. So we send our best, we send our condolences to the family and friends of, of uh, Murray and Sabine. I'm sure you've all got your memories and um, the ways you want to uh, think and remember those two absolutely amazing, amazing people. So God bless. And uh, yeah, they've definitely carved out uh, my career for me just by watching in particular Murray Walker. Right, Tony. Well said, Owen. Me, bro. I, do you know, I would have loved to have heard Murray Walker commentating on your driving. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a joke? <laughs> for, for those of you who are new to the show uh, this week, we've got some new, new names on the uh, participants list and a few new faces and a number of regulars as well. Um, each week we uh, speak with a special guest from the world of sport or entertainment and we ask about their plans for the year ahead, we have a look back on their, their career, and we'll explore with those stars and with you, the, the pit stop crew, some aspects around mental health as well, about how you look after your mind as well as your body, how you remain motivated and driven, and hopefully through having a bit of fun and laughs and, and interactive um, learning from one another, we'll pick up some top tips of keeping well and what to do if things start to get on top of you as well. Oh, to you, Paul, whilst I admit some more people. Yes, very nice. Uh, just a quick one there. Chris Yates, you look like you were jumping around and it looks like uh, there was a massive bridge behind you. I got a bit worried then, mate, but um, you've obviously sorted out. It looked like you had some kind of computer glitch, which was quite nice. Um, and Chris Hosey's back. Look, I love Chris Hosey's um, backdrops. He's got Murray Walker. Uh, he's got a picture of himself with Murray Walker. I absolutely love that picture. I've seen that on, on Twitter the other day. Um, so, yeah. 
And that, that's what leads me on to my next little bit of spiel that I always say. And it's just that I love this platform. And it was Tony that said to me, we should do it this way, because I just love the fact that we can see everybody's smiley faces. You know, some people won't want to be on camera. Fully appreciate that. Um, weirdly, if people don't know me, I, I raced British touring cars for 20 years. No, I didn't. No, I've raced for 20 years. I've tried to race British touring cars for about 15 years and crashed in a lot of those years. But it was it was a great time in that championship, but I always hated the camera. So if you don't want to have the camera on, I completely understand that because I weirdly now I work as a presenter in when ITV Sport, I actually don't massively like uh, cameras and I have to uh, deal with my own situation to be on it. So just to make sure you know that I'm with you if you don't want to have your camera switched on. But it is good, it's interactive. And the best thing about this is that you guys can get involved by asking questions. There's a chat facility at the bottom. Ask your question on there. Myself and Tony, especially, would monitor those questions because we want you to ask Maria, especially today, questions can be anything. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them. And we can switch your camera on and you can ask them yourself. And that's what I love about this because it's good to just get uh, heavily involved. Last thing I'll say is... Uh, the Positive Pit Stop is on Facebook, uh, which is wicked. So please get on over there because that's where we announce our new guests for the show. But also it's a place where you can speak about the show in general. Tell us what you want to see more of. Tell us what you want to see less of. Don't say me or I'll shoot you. Um, and also it, you can just speak about anything. Meet, chat, get involved. Um, and yeah, we can just have a little bit of a good time. Toe me. Super. So that leads us nicely introducing tonight's star guest, who you'll have seen sat quietly smiling in the top corner of your screens, waiting whilst we prattle on. Um, as Paul mentioned, we're staying on two wheels, and I have to admit, I've had a really rubbish day today. But it's just been a horrible mental health day today. Just loads of stuff didn't happen, and I felt rubbish. And knowing who we were having on the show tonight, just made, I knew the day was going to get better. Um, really looking forward to this. Um, it's the first guest we've ever had who has an MBE after their name. Uh, Maria's been a, a trailblazer for women in motorsport, uh, competed at the very top of bike racing, um, and has been a regular competitor at iconic events, including the Isle of Man TT, where she became the first woman solo rider to stand on the podium. Uh, she's also competed at events such as the Manx Grand Prix, Northwest 200 and Goodwood Revival. And uh, I'm also looking forward to hearing an anecdote about the Cock of the North at uh, Oliver's Mount, hopefully at some point, which I know someone in the audience will particularly enjoy hearing. Um, in between racing, Maria's established the first women-only track days, uh, initially at my local circuit, actually, Teesside Autodrome, and then expanding out to multiple circuits. And she's also appeared on film, TV, and somehow fits in journalism too. So, over to you, Paul. Ah, Maria then. So, listen, welcome. And firstly, thank you so much for coming on board. Um, you, We obviously have a friend um, mutually, Steve Brogan, um, who I was speaking to about yourself, and he absolutely loves you. I mean, he hates most people, but Brogan... <laughs> Why is that? Why do you why do you and Brogy get on so well? He, he's like, oh, he sounds MA, she be bossing it la. <laughs> oh look, this is I'm can I talk now? Can I talk now? This is so wonderful being on here. Thank you for inviting me on. What a wonderful place you've got here. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Love Brogy. Yeah. Well, he's just he's just one of the best, isn't he? He's one of the best characters. And I've known him for such a long time. We've been around for a long time. So that's very kind of him. Love back to Brogy. And oh. uh, it's just great to be here. It's just great to be part of this. So thank you. Ah, oh, don't be daft. And listen, I know, do you know what's really funny is um, when you said about, oh, I'm going to speak now. I hate scripts, right? Hate them. And it, it sets off a bit of anxiety that I do have and I can't stand them. And Tony, writes the most wordy script in the world and all I have to do is I just write them like that so his script is about 16 pages long I have to write it into one piece of A4 just so I don't get nervous and I'm not like all over the shop so, so blame him for that um, but yeah do you know 
you guys on two wheels, I mean, there'll be a lot of people in the audience that are, that are more used to four wheels. Um, I, I was speaking to Brogy about it and he always said, oh, you know, car snobs make you lot four wheels, car snobs. And his take on it is funny because generally people who race cars do have a bit more money, don't they? So, you know, why, actually, I'm just going to ask you straight away. <laughs> why, why two wheels? Did your mum not go? No, no, no. She absolutely went, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> motorbikes for me were a mode of transport initially. It was literally lived out in the sticks. Um, I was training and working as a veterinary nurse, needed to get to work. Fed up of relying on my dad giving me lifts, and I'm sure he was fed up too. And uh, I've got a moped, <laughs> a Honda Melody. I used to thrash it to work and back. The vets were forever like readjusting the brake cables on it. Um, and anyway, a bit moved on to a, a TZR 125, um, which, yeah, my mum was not happy about. She had to come to the dealership to sign the. Um, finance document she walked out the shop we had to drag her back to get her to sign that uh, not ha she thought I was getting another uh, scooter or something so this you know big proper motorbike thing she was not impressed and then I went and got knocked off it in my own village as my mum's walking down the street no word of a lie um this guy with dodgy eyesight um t-boned me um I ended up hitting a wall I'm lying on the floor my mum used to smoke and she's like running over and she's got a cigarette I'm lying on the floor going put your cigarette out mum and um anyway I I was okay you know I went to hospital I had broken some bones she thought that was the end of motorbikes it was actually the start because I got compensation money and I bought a race bike oh my it, it, honestly is that how it works <laughs> honestly so no wait, Maria then. So people won't know this on and here watching, but I don't know, except for my forehead. Can you oh, see that scar yeah. I've got now on my head? Yeah. Like not, not many not many people see that, but I used to get to uh, <laughs> put the Mickey out of school because people used to say, Oh, look at him, he shaves his eyebrows. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, No, I've had it since I was five. So I had a, a car accident with my dad when I was five. Oh. And I was not interested in cars whatsoever. But when I come out of hospital, my mum said. All I wanted was cars, and that's where my obsession come from. And the the money I got from that car accident in 1985 got put into a into a solicitor's account, um, and I got paid. I can't remember how much it was, but it paid for my first ever race car on my 18th birthday, New Year's. Oh my Eve, god! It. So that's how it happened for me. So it's the same for you then. Yeah. I mean that it was a it was a decent chunk of money, you know. There was no way my parents were ever gonna. They didn't have money to even put into a car for me, you know. So it's never they were never gonna help me to go racing. I had to be a bit of a defiant daughter, and which I definitely was. And uh, yeah, that's how I started racing. Bought my own bike, went bike racing. That's that's crazy. Because to be fair, just so you know, so couple of questions down it, what i was going to ask was you know for the for people who don't know what what actually um you know got you into it um you know into a into an amazing career you know what where do you go where do you go so i mean i so i trained as a veterinary nurse qualified as a veterinary nurse went through all that hard work blood sweat mud poop everything and then scrapped all that and started working in a motorbike shop because um I was in I used to always really good social scene in the, in the bike shops those days and I was always down the local bike shop and um chatting to the guys behind the counter and they're like oh Sid's looking for a sales assistant why don't you go and ask and I literally was like yeah um can you know can I put in for that job got it and was working in a bike shop as a sales assistant that then led to me getting loads more friends who rode bikes a couple of lads they had a friend that raced introduced me to him he is still my friend to this day and uh, but he became my mentor he raced 250s he helped me find my first race bike so I came and checked it out with me and I got an RGV 250 and I had an RGV 250 on the road as well at the same time. I looked like a complete spoilt brat, but I'd done it all myself. 
and uh, yeah, I used to go off racing. I, I somehow managed to get in the local newspapers and get sponsors on board. I, I did that from word dot, you know, I had no, no past experience or but I was like I've got to get some help to make this happen so I had budget rent a van give me a van I my dad always had vans I was very comfortable in vans and that suited me and then I'd, I'd go off David park up I'd park next door and um go racing <laughs> that's unbelievable because your most of your a lot everything really is is road racing for you isn't it so now it's road racing, yeah. But stop, couldn't have really started road racing. I mean, my hero was Steve Hislop, and um, so I knew about the TTT. But this was another thing I promised to my mum when I started racing. She went, you won't go to the Isle of Man place, will you? <laughs> honestly, 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 she said that. And I was like, no, no, just of course. I never aspired to that. I just wanted to go bike racing. And then a few years down the line, we're at the launch of the new team I'm part of, one of the first all-female teams in the UK, with Sandra Barnett, who was the fastest woman around the TT at the time, and another girl, Bridget McManus, we're all teaming up. We would go and do the Manx. So my my, my mum and dad are there, and the team manager stands up and says that we're going to the Isle of Man. What does my mum do? She walks out. <laughs> yeah, my poor mum. My poor mum. Not happy. That's crazy because, like we've spoke offline, because we don't we don't actually speak that much to be fair, do we? But um, I was I was intrigued that not no one in the family really is no one was anything to do with bike racing. It's the same with my family. They're musicians, and you know they didn't know anything about racing. That's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you kind of have to hold their hand as well. You go, well, this is this is what this is. My dad, just to put you into perspective, my dad is a taxi driver or was. He thought that British touring cars, which I drove, were were four wheel drive. Kind of, that's true. They were, <laughs> but four wheel drive, turbocharged and supercharged. He thought it was the best of everything, and then you just went racing. No, Dennis, that's not what it is. It must be hard though. Yeah, no, exactly. I my. My family were one of my biggest obstacles going racing because when you're, it's a tough game anyway for anyone, definitely a bit tricky being female and then having your family. I, I fell out with my family. I didn't hold my family's hand. I fell out with them because they were really struggling with it. And it, mu it must have been so hard that a very old fashioned um, took them a long time to have me. So my my parents are a sort of older, another generation older. And they were just like, what the hell is our daughter playing at? Like, <laughs> this isn't a proper job. And not that I, I, I was still doing, I was still veterinary nursing and whatnot then. But uh, it was very hard for them. Very hard for them. I mean, of course, we made up and then they would come along to some meetings. I do remember them turning up unannounced at Mallory Park. My mate Steve Britter was helping me on the spanners. I was actually in the back putting a sprocket on the wheel. And he went, I think this is your mum and dad. I went, no, it's not. And, and they turned up at the van and my dad went, I didn't know you could use spanners. And I was thinking, you don't know a lot about me. You know, and they, di they didn't, they, they didn't, I, I would sort of, yeah. I mean, of course, 25 years of racing, they learned a lot about it, um, but I've put, I've put them through it. Can you really can, use spanners? <laughs> well, look, I'm not a good mechanic and I try not to do much of that at all anymore. I'm just not very confident because I don't do it enough. I definitely prefer having mechanics and I think I've got some of my, I think some mechanics who helped me out are, have joined tonight, actually. I think a, a couple of us have. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that who it was? I bet people are thinking, oh, Neil's voice has changed. Why is he asking about <laughs> Sam? <laughs> I was like, Jesus, who's that? <laughs> hey, but that, that is a good question, though, because I, I, I actually, the mechanics that I've had on my car, they laugh at me because... Word got round in the paddock that I know nothing about cars. I actually don't know anything about cars. So they used to they used to get um, 
used to get the tops off the, you know, the radiator and the coolant and the, the uh, power steering pumps and uh, they're electric now, but they were hydraulic and they, they'd go, right, what's put this back on the car? Or like, this is a top British touring car team, Vauxhall, like AAA. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. honestly, I would, I would blow a car up if I was a mechanic. But you have to know in bikes because it's, it's kind of a bit more... I, I know, I... Yes, and um, I built my own super twin with, with a boyfriend at the time because the, I was normally going off racing on my own. So I, I learned more then and I did more then. Now I do try not to get my hands too dirty because, like I say, I'm not so great at it. But, yeah, my <laughs> motorbikes are simpler to work on, I think, than cars. You do have to know. I mean, I used to get tested by some, like, back when I started. I think it it was a bit difficult for some of the they used to change the suspension on the bike to see if I noticed and I was like can you please stop that now because yes I can notice and I don't need to be tested like that but hey it was a massive learning curve for all of us because the whole working with a female who was the rider was was very different for them too I was going to say that it must be um and Tony might touch on this but you know the, the female side of things, and this is a hot, and, I and this is not a sexist thing to say, but bikes are, are very they're, they're looked at as a as a manly thing, aren't they? Or they used to be. I'd like to think that that's a past phrase, but it, that must have been a difficult thing to overcome. Like, and that's just me speaking generally because I'm not a woman. I don't know how that would be for, for you. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. I think. Because I've been involved for so long, so we're talking 25 years, thankfully, I can say that there has been change. There is change. It is improving. Um, back when I started, you, 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 you're welcomed into the race paddock, um, but when you start beating the guys, they stop talking to you. You're not, you're, they don't really want to be friends then because they're struggling with the fact that a woman's beaten them and... We, they've come from a society, we've all come from a society where that shouldn't be happening because it was a man's world. And, you know, it kind of fueled my fire at the start because I wanted to beat the boys at their own game. That's how I saw it. Now I don't see it as that, of course, because I've had to evolve too. The world's still got a lot of changing to do. And, um, you know, I, I love one of the biggest things about my sport is the fact that I get to compete against men on equal terms. That means the world to me. And I'm fiercely protective of that. Um, of course, it's wonderful seeing more women and girls participating and, you know, real good talent coming into the sport, um, which is thanks to new classes, smaller CC bikes. That's definitely helping making things more affordable. And um, that's, that's, that's really cool seeing that happen. But, you know, the sports had to sort of evolve to make that happen. I think we could definitely do more. Our governing body could do more. And I've, I've been involved with the FIM, the Women's Commission, and um, mentored for women's championships and things, and definitely really keen to do as more of that. And I think we still need to shout about women and what they're doing and when they're doing good things. Obviously, we've just not long ago had International Women's Day, and it's wonderful that a lot of women and girls are going, oh, do we really need this? And I don't think we really need this now. But actually, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Why? It's a chance for us to celebrate what we're doing and highlight what we're doing. Because young girls coming in, they you don't know, you can't be what you don't see it's important that they see that they can do this. This is this is a potential career for them, like it is for the guys. I think you're dead right there, you know. And it, What I've noticed is, and we all know that social media can be the best thing in the world, and it can be the worst thing in the world. I think we all know that, every single person in every single box I'm looking at, that's definitely something, but... I have noticed that this year, the International Women's Day hashtag was used so much and there were so many wicked stories. I honestly do think, as a guy, not as a woman, because I'll never know what it's like, but we are 
that we're not turning. I don't think I don't think we can really return in a ninety degree corner. There's a curve that we can just see round, isn't there? It's yep. definitely changing. And I see that from very good friends like Abby Eaton from the car world and Jade Edwards. And and it's down to you guys, Rob Marsh. Yes. It's down to you women, what we're seeing now. That is my personal opinion. You yeah. women have done such an amazing thing for the next generation. And, you know, I look on these screens now, it's 50% women in my, in my boxes. And that is, that's a massive change, a massive change. Do you think the same thing? Yeah, I mean, obviously when I, I wanted to go racing because I wanted to go racing, not because I wanted to make a standpoint about women and, and I understand that that's what all the other women are doing. They want to go racing. But I think it's important to recognize that actually, for, for me, definitely, because I've been around for so long, I have a role to play in, in that sort of part of it, if you like. You know, I'm in a position where I can hopefully help and highlight the fact that lots of women are doing good stuff. And I think it is important to lift each other up. I know that's cliche and all of that. There's no harm in that at all. No, I think, I think you're dead right. And, you know, just, just for me quickly, personally, it, I can only, I only see what you're doing and it's a completely different ball game. But with me being a type one diabetic, I don't feel duty to show everybody, every other diabetic that it's possible. But I kind of think if I've got the platform and I'm doing okay, why not show it off? Because it might help someone. That's all I see it as for, for me personally. Yeah, and that's and because we all do really live on social media, I think um, it does, and, and you're right, I've got that platform, so why don't I use it? For positive, you know. Definitely. Um, right, out of the current crop of riders, um, who do you like competing against the most? Well, um... I'm going to say John McGuinness because he's a 23 times TT winner. And this is where I get the chance to say, I was on a podium with him at the Isle of Man at the Classic TT. And I won't lie, it, it made that podium all the better. I know, no word of a lie, on the last lap, not only am I talking to my motorbike to make sure it finishes, because that's what you have to do, I'm also thinking, I hope John McGuinness is, is, I know I've got boards, I'm third, and I'm thinking, come on, come on, let's, please, please, can I cross the line in third? But I'm also thinking, I hope John McGuinness is winning this. I hope he's flipping winning this. And because he's ha he'd had a lot of trouble, it, it was actually the first time he'd finished that particular senior classic TT. And... Um, yeah, he won it. And to share the podium with him was massive. That is unreal. And, you know, you may have just answered my last question before I hand, hand back to Tony. And that was, what races or what's your career highlight of, of, of everything? And you have just, like, explained that situation. <laughs> to me. Is, it, is it that one? It is that one. It is that one. It, you know, if we're on, if we're both on super bikes, I can't get anywhere near him. But put us, you know, the, it's a more level, level playing field when we're on the classic bikes and um, just it meant so much more, yeah, sharing that with him. I love it. And he's a good guy, isn't he, John? I've worked with John when he was Honda HM plant or Honda Paget. I was driving a, a Honda touring car and we went to oh. uh, like a question in motorsport for Honda what a character he definitely needs a PA to wind his neck in sometimes. <laughs> and that's why everyone loves John because nothing stops him being John McGuinness and everyone loves him for his stories. Yeah. He's not afraid to tell it how it is. And we, and we all love him for it. And he's, he's played lots of parts in my career throughout it. He's helped me with learning the course and, you know, he, he is a good guy. Yeah. That's amazing because he doesn't need to do that, does he? Need to do no, that. he doesn't. Well, so that thing. meant a lot. I absolutely love it. Yes, yes, yes. Right, Toe, what's going on, lad? Okay, well, there's a few questions coming in. So, whilst I am just unmuting James's iPhone uh, to ask the first question to Maria, um, 
I'm also just going to read out whilst hopefully he's unmuting, just a comment from Jim uh, about Maria to say, tell her that's so refreshing to hear that parents were an obstacle. People are usually gushing about how much they owe to their parents and how they would never have got where they are without their tremendous support. So it was really refreshing to hear an honest opinion on how life really was. No, well, I hear that all the time too, because obviously a lot of people in sport that I look up to always seem to talk about, oh, my parents helped me get to where I was. And I always used to think, mine didn't. <laughs> and, and yeah, it, it probably, you know, maybe it would have helped, but they just didn't understand what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and James, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be able to unmute. So I shall ask his question, which is, what is Maria's favourite road race circuit and which section sequence? OK, so the TT, of course, the Isle of Man TT. It's because it stands alone. There's nothing else like it, even though I do all those other road races and I've done pretty much all of them. There's I'm a different racer when I get to the TT. Even though we've done other road races that year, when I stand on Glen Crutchery Road and get ready to race there, it's a very different feeling. And so that's why it has to stand out for me. Um, but the Ulster Grand Prix is an amazing road race. And because, so obviously it's shorter, it's, it's about nine odd miles long. And I can say I love all of the Ulster because it's so fast. It's just so fast. And um, unfortunately it's it's um, struggling to stay alive at the moment. They've, they've had some issues with the club and it, it obviously wouldn't have run last year because of the pandemic but it wouldn't have run anyway and I'm hoping it gets back on its feet because it's such a wonderful place to race a bike because it's so fast it's um you know flat out corners everywhere and they used to have sidecar racing there they don't anymore but I'm always on to the organizers to try and bring it back because I think taking a sidecar around there would be amazing Oh, fingers crossed you are out, back out on those circuits and everyone is out on those circuits next year, hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed. Um, just going back to the TT, uh, I was over on the Isle of Man about three years ago. Um, I had a, a couple of days with, with the government uh, over there and uh, I, I was put up in a house of one of the guys who's on the organising committee of the TT. And uh, we, we were heading out in the morning for meetings and he said, well, I've got about an hour and a half to kill. So either we can go and have a coffee or we can sit in my M3 and go 37 <laughs> miles round the island. And never having seen it for real life, I was treated to um, a pretty sporty lap of 37 mm -hmm. miles of the TT course. And I mean, what, what really struck me from it is, is A, just how much concentration is needed to be riding flat out for 37 miles. Whereas, you know, circuit racing, you've got, what, probably two and a half miles to learn, and you, you can remember the 12 corners. But you've got hundreds of corners, but you've got bumps, you've got jumps, you've got bridges, you've got grates, drains, all sorts of stuff. So... How do you how do you even go about learning a, a circuit that's that big? You know, you know when you're at school and you're good at the subject that you love, it's the same thing. I love the TT. I want to do the TT. So because of that, you learn it. And of course, it's absolutely imperative that you do. Um, and you, you just learn it. I could I could sit and bore you all and tell you a lap now. I literally could, because that's what you have to do with that place. Yeah, so there's over 200 odd corners. It's real roads. When you say bumps, I mean, you haven't met bumps like you will meet at, around the TT course. You go up and down a mountain, you go through villages. Um, it's got everything. And it, I'm still, I pinch myself that I'm still racing there, that I'm still fortunate enough to compete there because it means the absolute world to me and um 
Yeah, it's like nothing else. How, it's, how, it's just, sorry, uh, when 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 you ride in the circuit, are you are you thinking about the here and now, the corner that you're taking, or are you thinking two corners ahead, three corners ahead? Yeah, because you can't go fast without knowing where you're going. So it's the same as any any form of racing. It's the same thing, visualization. You so you've got to have it in your mind, and, and you're already thinking a couple of corners ahead. But also being able to deal with the corner that you're in right now, and that's absolutely key at the TT. Like you say, it's nearly forty miles long a lap, but we don't just do one lap. We'll do three laps in the cycle, at least four laps on the super twin, six laps in the senior race or the, the super bike race. Um, okay, so you're having a pit stop after every two laps because that's how much fuel the tank can hold. Um, but it's, um, it's like nothing else. Oh. Best thing I've ever done. So in terms of, I mean, not just the TT, but, but all the road racing that you do, um, you mentioned their visualisation. How, how do you mentally prepare before a race? What routine do you have on, on race morning? Yeah, so um, the, the shorter circuit, say somewhere like Scaries or something, that will be a visualisation that I'll do in my head. The TT, I nearly always watch a lap before I go out. So I've got like my favourite on board that I'll use. I mean, I'm actually really fortunate now because I've got some on boards of my own that I can use. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll, I'll do a physical warm up. Obviously, I've already eaten and drank and hydrated. And but uh, the difference with the TT is that you can you can get ready and then do all your warm up, get into your leathers, walk up to the road through the paddock, and then there'll be a delay. And um, that's a, another massive part that you have to learn to deal with. Um, the you know whether it's weather or there's been some kind of incident. I mean, we've had houses on fire. So obviously that has to be dealt with before we, you know, the, the road can be cleared. Um, so lots, lots going on there, but I've raced there for 20 years. So I've pretty much learned how to deal with that. I think, I think I watched the whole of Avatar once whilst waiting for a race. <laughs> Which can't be ideal preparation. <laughs> No, thankfully it got cancelled. It was absolutely lashing with rain and I was so relieved when they cancelled it eventually. But yeah, you can have a race that's supposed to start at 10.45 in the morning and we actually started at 6.30 at night. Wow. So that's, get your head around that one. That's a long day of preparation. Really long day. And, you know, you mentioned incidents. Um, actually, when I, I had the lap in the car, um, I did hear about a lot of very unfortunate incidents uh, around the route. And I mean, it's fair to say you've had your fair share of, of broken bones during your career. Um, when you've been out injured, how, how have you managed to keep yourself motivated? What, what work have you done to keep yourself sharp? And, and how do you get back out on the bike and ride flat out again when you've broken femur or whatever? The the long and the short of it is that it's my love and my passion and um, because it's because it's the best thing I've ever done when you break a bone like a femur it's very very painful <laughs> and um, I had to spend six months I wasn't allowed to weight bear at all for three months I was 50% weight bearing for three three months and that's that's so that's at the very beginning of it I, di I did get back racing the next year, so that's, but it's a very long process. But ultimately, once the pain starts going, thankfully, you can't remember pain. You can remember that you've had pain, but you can't remember actual pain, which is a great thing for us humans. So obviously the pain starts easing and I want to get back to what I love. And, and that's what takes me back there. Um, I've broken, yeah, 24 odd bones, which evens out to like one a year um, in my career. But yes, yeah, so there's there's been lots to um, get over. I've had some amazing physios. I'm, I'm thankfully, I really like staying fit. I actually need to do that now because my, I dread to think what would happen if I don't keep that up. 
Um, and, and obviously I want to carry on racing a little bit longer, so I need to keep that up. Um, but ultimately it's, it's, it's getting back to what I love. So that's what drives me ultimately. That's awesome. Thank you. Right. It's time for one of our, one of our infamously dreadful quizzes. So uh, hopefully, Paul, you're not frozen. You don't look frozen on my screen, but are you there, Owie? I'm just massively intrigued. I mean, it just sounds just dangerous, man. Maria, it's just dangerous. Unfortunately, it, dangerous. it is, but um, I still love it. Oh, man. It just sounds like one of my ex-relationships, to be fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. This quiz will be more dangerous than a lap of the TT with me on a thousand R R R R R R G S X R R R R or whatever it is that you ride. Right. Are you ready for this <clears throat> quick fire quiz? It's uh, time to get. It's time to uh, get to know Maria. And um, favorite food? Everything. I love food. <laughs> Chocolate. Chocolate. Nice answer. Favourite drink? Kahlua. Oh, in the espresso martinis? So I don't drink a lot, but I, yeah, that's um, a bit of a favourite. Kahlua sounds like some crazy continental bike racer who's come in for a go of the TT. <laughs> <laughs> right. Favourite rider, past or present? I'm going to say David Jeffries and Steve Hislop. Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, favorite circuit? TT Ulster. <laughs> nice. It just just scares me all that. Oh, TT. Oh. Um, favorite other sport? Hmm. Uh, I'm gonna go with cycling or mountain biking. Yeah, I like my push bike stuff. Yeah, that's been a bit of a savior for mountain bike during all this. I'm with you. I did 20 miles a day. Um, I know, I know, I'm, I'm on it. After my COVID jab, I didn't know what I was doing, but I still got round. Um, Hollyoaks or Emmerdale? Hollyoaks, if I had to watch one. <laughs> Blur or Oasis? Blur. Ooh. Yeah, really don't like the other one. Oh, Spanner in the works. Why don't you like the other one? She's muted now. <laughs> <laughs> it's proper done you there <laughs> sorry it's not my cup of tea not my cup of tea i don't really like manx either so don't worry not the manx tt right. <laughs> spice girls or little mix be careful with this one gotta be the spice girls it's my era exactly fair play to you and um, elvis presley or elvis costello but you've never heard that one before it's Elvis Costello, of course. <laughs> but everyone thinks that my nickname Elvis is Presley and they always do the, I'm not even going to try and do the Elvis oh. impression. <laughs> and then I'm like, what's my surname? And they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Let us move on. Um, so you worked in a bit of TV and film? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, How's that for you? And is there any assholes that you can tell us about? Sorry about that. I um, haven't done very much. I'd love to do more. I was a stunt double <laughs> for, um, oh, I've forgotten her name now. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon. I oh. never actually met her. Um, Christina Ricci was also a part of this and we, we did get to hang out although I found her really boring because <laughs> all she talked about was going to the mall and I couldn't really connect anyway um, and Christina Ricci yeah I never actually met her she literally would come in in a big Range Rover with loads of sort of bodyguards get on say her lines and vanish and I when I say stunt double I was only riding a scooter but it was so much fun the producer one it one day he was like we, they were like blocking off streets in London and he went right we're going to put the camera on the floor we want you to come as fast and as close to it as you can and I was like yay and I did it and he went okay can you go back a bit and slower please you're not at the TT now he said <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing I I haven't really done, I haven't really done that much filming precision stuff like before I've done a bit only a bit in cars but 
that must be a graft that on a bike. I know it's only a scooter, but still, you have to get it right. That was easy peasy. I'm not a stunt rider. I'm not by a long shot. I think if I show off, it always goes wrong. I, um, obviously, bike racing is a different thing, but um, it was good fun and it paid really well. Yeah. Oh, I can tell you a story, but I won't. I bought. I got the deposit for my first ever house in 2013 for an advert for Ford. I couldn't get my breath how much they were paying us for three days. I was like, I was living with my mum and dad at the time. I was 33, didn't have any money. Just stopped racing touring cars. And I got a phone call and they were like, yeah, do you uh, want to do this advert for Ford? And I had to get out of a touring car job at Thruxton. <laughs> I'll tell you this now, because we're all family. It was, I think it was 28 grand I got. I was there for three days, right? <laughs> and then I got a repeat fee the next year. <laughs> so I bought another house. Bloody hell. So you could buy houses for fun in witness for that much money. <laughs> wow. Um, I didn't earn that much. Blimey. No, I just, Maria, can I tell you something? That was a total joke. Because I just wanted to see everybody's reaction. I only actually got about... <laughs> I think about four grand or something, which is amazing anyway. But all I could see were people going, and then I could lip read a few going. <laughs> 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 oh my god, amazing! But yeah, it, it does it paid better than your average coaching job. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and it was you know, it, it it was hardly any time. You know, you just in a couple of minutes ride in the scooter, and I was like. Geez, I definitely picked the wrong career here. I know, um, it's amazing. That's all gone, I think, now, though, isn't it? That kind of money from manufacturers that even before the pandemic, it was it was kind of like yeah. production companies getting loads of money and it just doesn't happen now, does it? I think I think it's still an industry filled with money. And um, yeah, I wouldn't mind some more work there. <laughs> but um we yeah. should go in as a double team. We should go in. We Why be aren't we doing that? Why aren't I don't we doing know. that? I'm bad. I'm bored here. What's going on? For heaven's sake, sign me up. I'm ready. And we need to get you on my sidecar. <laughs> right. That's what we were going to chat about, weren't we? So uh, look at everyone's like, yeah, get, get on, get O'Neill on the sidecar. They would probably all do a little. Um, like How a much would they pay to see you do that? Thousands. And they pay you extra money to, unfortunately, <laughs> Superman me out of the ghosty me out of the sidecar. We'll put Vaseline on the handle so you can't stay. <laughs> Imagine. Everybody put the thumbs up if they want to see me ghostied out of a sidecar. Oh, I'm in so much trouble. Um, but, yeah, we need, we need that to happen, actually, don't we? We'll, we should... Let's let's speak about this offline. I will definitely. Okay. I'd love to come on board because I've, you know, I've been on the back of a, a thousand, a, a Honda Fireblade with Steve at Rockingham, but it wasn't. It was a road bike, and okay, yeah, it was interesting. And I've got a Kawasaki thousand R myself, but I am on track days. Oh my god, I get lapped by. Oh, like, we should do a track day. Right, we'll do a track day then. Me, Tim Harvey, who who I work with in British Touring Cars, oh, yeah. we go on track days together. I've done two. Oh. I lied to get in the intermediate group instead of done ten. Don't tell anybody that anyone because that's probably going to invalidate my insurance. We heard the truth <laughs> from Brogy last week. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, so I, so Maria, I went on a day with Brogy on his superbike school, and honestly, like he was, he was excellent. And I'm gonna. My next question is about coaching, but he. As much as a people didn't really get the full picture of Steve that day on here because he's one of the funniest people I know. And he's oh, probably, is serious, it, serious, unreal. Serious is is one of those absolute gems of a. He's just he's a big hearted bloke. That's the thing. I I don't see him that often anymore. We perhaps do the Goodwood event. We bump into each other there, and he's always and all his family as well. Wonderful, but yeah, and, and I've seen him do his coaching. In fact. I think the last time I was on a track was at Donington and we shared the same garage. And it was like, all right, Maria. And I'm like, oh. And I was, I was more nervous about going out on track because I do it so rarely, really. But um, yeah, no, it was good fun. That's what I was going to ask you about, actually. Do you know, so when you're coaching, because I, I do quite a lot of coaching myself, a lot of private stuff. But when you do it and you've done it before, it, would you rather have someone who's a complete novice to coach or would you rather have someone who is 
super fast as a club racer and looking for that extra four tenths per second. How do you see it? I'm going to say the novice. Um, mm. On my, I, I haven't got to do my ladies track days for a while. Just financially, it's tricky. I, you know, I have to find some financial backing to make them happen and I will because I loved doing them but that that was the reason I loved doing them. I used to have complete full spectrum of women who've just passed their test to women who have already got their race license but I loved I loved working with those ladies that were actually because it was an all-female environment they could show their how they were so there was a lot of nervous ladies right and I just said, I get nervous going on a track. So I totally understand where they're coming from. And I loved the fact that by the end of the day, they're having the best time ever. Their confidence has gone through the roof. They're riding their bike better and they're going home a more competent rider, safer rider, having had an awesome day. So I think getting those last little extra bits, you know, of improvement for races is great. And, and I've loved coaching lots of women and, did that through the FIM as well but I just I just yeah I th there's there's almost more to be gained from seeing those women who are just starting out or, or have lost their confidence and, and giving that you know helping them find that again yeah that's I, great I'm full of, I'm I'm fully with you on that because <clears throat> I I have a lot of private clients some are like super stock to BSB so Clio Cup to British touring cars and yeah. as much as I love finding them that tenth and half that they've been struggling to find it's so intense and it's because it's such a profession for them and that's awesome yeah I don't see as many smiles because they accept that that's what they need to do but the novices I coach is just it's like you've you've like you have made fire with your hands and I love that I love yeah. seeing that from people and that that's that's the good thing isn't it I mean, I had like 70 odd women at Donington. I was absolutely worn out at the end of it. My, my days aren't super structured, but I definitely try and ride with them all. So that was, I was literally on track nearly all the time because I, I just wanted to be able to have that conversation with them afterwards and go, yep, yeah, you've improved on that. Or, and um, yeah, the, the feedback was overwhelming and it, God, there's, no, there's nothing better than that. I, that almost equals, you know, feelings you get from racing. Yeah, that's awesome, isn't it? Um, last question from me. You've driven, and you said about an RGV 250. My, my, all my, my, I've got two, I did have two brothers. Both of them were into their bikes massively. And Stuart, uh, God bless him, he had a, an RGV 250. He had all these um, other bikes I can remember growing up. And I was never into bikes until 2002 when I started racing. And I was like, I want to go faster. So that's why I've got a bike. But you mentioned RGVs. Um, I'm, fortunately, my nephew has still got my brother's RGV 250, which is an Aprilia engine, I think. I think they share the, the same engine. Um, that's the only thing I know about. But um, I had an RS Aprilia 125, all them kind of mega bikes. But what from riding modern you know, bikes and, and the classic bikes, what is your favourite standout bike that you've, that you've ever ridden? There's a lot to choose from because especially, you know, the past probably five years, I would race 12 different motorcycles in a season. So that's a lot of motorbikes to get through and then add in the fact that I've been racing for 25 years. So that's a lot of motorbikes. The classic stuff, obviously the pattern, um, the classic pattern that I was on the podium at the Isle of Man, that mm -hmm. is just a dream to ride. But the hand shift 1929 BMW that they supercharged um, that I raced at Goodwood Revival is just one of the best things ever. It's like, so you're changing gear with the hand rather than your foot. You have, and so it's a bit like patting your head and running, rubbing your tubbing at the same time. But it's the best experience on two wheels it was wild a uh, teammate was Troy Corsa he also raced one he won the race and um he he just highlighted it for everyone I mean he 
he went, he lapped so fast on that bike. It's got no suspension. It's got a couple of springs in the seat. That's your suspension. It bucks. It used to just buck me out. The thing's moving all the time like this. And at first we're thinking, right, get your body weight over the front and pin it. And, and Troy's like, no, let it go. Let it go. And I'm like, right. Yeah. Okay. So I can let it go to some degree. He goes to another level level that's how he won the race I, the thing's out of control it's bouncing off the ground like a foot off the ground I'm not joking and it but for me to experience that was out of this world and to do it at Goodwood at the revival as well which is just an outstanding event I mean it's like it's another pinch me moment it's like dreams you know it's that's that's pretty amazing that, you know, because I was I was there that day and I was watching because I think Brogy was in the same race, I think, on a on a Norton. Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, and um he was he said he was like, Mace, watch the speed of this. And I could see because I think he was just going down the straights like yeah. past everyone. But it's like the bumpiest circuit in the world. It's like going around Thruxton. <laughs> That's not bumpy, by the way. Please come to the Isle of Man, I'll show you some bumps. That is not bumpy, <laughs> but I get it. And, um, oh, yeah, being part of all that and being part of the BMW team, being teammates with Troy Corsa is pretty damn cool. You know, sharing a track with Brogy and all the other guys because it, it's become definitely a lot more fashionable to race classic bikes now. I, I started doing it a long time before all the top boys joined in. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's that bike's pretty special. Yeah, it's cool. It's really, really cool. And I love the revival and I just love the fact Troy Course is such a ledge. I've interviewed him for BMW and, and uh, yeah, great, great people. So, so cool. They've just got so many funny stories, the bikers. Um, right. I'm concerned a bit about time because uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, go on too much with yourself, Maria, because I know you've got uh, other things to do. Tony, it's over to you. What is occurring, you little lid lizard head? Well, as you know, Paul, it's uh, your favourite time where we ask the quiz between yourself and Maria. And um, there's not a lot to live up to on this one, Maria, because generally no one gets the answers right. And actually the, the audience have more of a clue what's going on uh, than we do. Cozy usually wins this. <laughs> he does indeed. But here we go. Some of these questions have been set by Martin Ridd, ITV producer. Some of them may have been set by me. So here we go. If you know the answer, shout out. What was Maria's surname in The Sound of Music? Oh, my God, I should know this. Never seen it. <laughs> you what? I've never you seen it. You're joking. I've seen it a million times and I don't know, though. Is that the one? The hills are alive with the sound of music. Could well be. I've never seen it, mate. Von Trapps. I win. Oh. One point to me. Um, which band reached number one in 1999 with Maria? Maria. Sunday. Yes. <laughs> one point to Costello. Um, who has more Insta followers, Maria or Oi? M Maria. <laughs> yeah. I know that. Yeah. I know that. I love people. I like. <laughs> um, which Maria is a tennis Grand Slam champion? Sharon Pover. Yeah. That's uh, two to all. Um, so let's have the designing question. Who has the higher honours, Elvis Costello or Maria Costello? Me. Elvis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why is that, Tony? Totally? Uh, you were correct, Tony, I'm afraid. I, I only learnt today that an OBE is is ranked one higher than an MBE. And Elvis Costello wow. is an OBE. Maria's fuming now. I'm going back to the palace. That's it. <laughs> what are they playing at? Storm it. <laughs> Don't tell my mum. She'll be really upset. <laughs> And I, no, I didn't I, set that question. <laughs> I, I would just love to have some letters after my name, full stop. Uh, I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah, I think I might have. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got some cracking questions from the audience. This is where we open it up to, to you guys. 
Uh, my last question, actually, if it had been a tiebreak, was which Maria appears in Sonic the Hedgehog, Maria the Cat or Maria Robotnik? Robotnik. It is indeed. Wouldn't, right. wouldn't have got that. We're going to unmute a few microphones and we're going to start with Emily, Ooh. who had a really good question, if she can remember it, from about yeah. half an hour ago. Yeah, you're gonna I'm gonna have to use my brain now. What was it? <laughs> it's about oh yeah, if you hadn't yeah, if you haven't already, would you like to have a go in a sidecar, as in not on the bike, but in the actual sidecar? I've Please. tried it. I think they're crazy. It's really hard. Um, I'll stick to driving. <laughs> <laughs> you get but, thrown about a lot in those. But it's, it's actually a, it's a I hats off to everyone who's a passenger. I've had lots of women that have passengered my sidecars and they yeah, it's an incredible skill. It's actually a really great way to get into motorsport. It's a very easy license to get. And obviously you're you can turn up and jump on the side of someone's sidecar. So it's a it's a great way and you do see <laughs> lots of women doing it because it's accessible. Give okay. it a go. Great question. Uh, Chris, I <laughs> we'll see. I'm more of a car person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, Emily. Chris Yates. Uh, good evening. Um, yeah, you sat on your bike for the first ever TT race. What are you feeling? What's going through your mind? Yeah, uh, that was a long time ago. And it would have been at the Manx Grand Prix. So like the amateur version of the races. I think it... Even before you get to the race, you've got to do your practice laps. And our team manager decided that Bridget and I would start the first night of practice. And I was terrified. And I really didn't want to do this. I was like, no, I don't really want to go down Bray Hill first. I'd really prefer if I'm following somebody 10 seconds ahead of me. But so we had that extra pressure and extra nerves of going down Bray Hill for the first time first. So um, it was very terrifying, but I won't lie, three laps later, I knew I'd fallen in love with the place. But what was the feeling when you finished the race? Absolute adrenaline rush. You think you can just carry on doing laps all night long. You're <laughs> so full of adrenaline and you feel like that after a race. So say you've done a four lap race and you know, it's super physical, super mentally um, draining. But you think you can do it again straight off. You're just so full. adrenaline's an amazing thing. I've I've missed adrenaline. Yes. <laughs> My body misses it at the moment. Nice one, Chris. Uh Dave, Seuss Cox. I tried I tried to say this without losing my voice. <laughs> oh. When you were growing up, did you have any female sort of inspiration like icons, or did you just sort of just want to compete as you were? I I did I didn't really have any I didn't think I had any female icons or role models but what I've realized growing up at that actually my mum is and um yeah she's she doesn't realize how strong she is and I think I definitely get a lot of my determination and strength from her okay, thank you um I think at this part of the show we generally then unmute Rob Marsh um, and see if he has a question <laughs> for us. Are you sure? <laughs> Not totally, but it's a good chance to mute oh, you if I have the chance. Hello, I'm Robert the Muted. Um, I have Hi. got a question, actually. I have got a question, Tony. You're all right? Oh. Um, uh, just before that, I just have to say that I did have to move from downstairs, because um, not many people know this, but Paul O'Neill has actually got an obsession with my curtains. So for the first 45 minutes, when he was pretending to listen to what was going on, he was actually just staring at those. If you ask him what happened before quarter to eight, it was just going about my jungly drapes. It's not my problem, it's his. <laughs> anyway, I've got a seven-year-old daughter who likes racing, generally racing cars at the minute. And I've said to her, I don't want you to get a bike when you're older because I'm terrified of them. If she decides when she's older that she wants to get a bike and then gets one, how long do I have to cry for before I'm okay with it? 
you have to ask my mum. I, you know, it is a very scary um, position to be in as, as a parent. And this is why maybe we don't see that many girls come into the sport because it's difficult for their parents to let them do something that looks so scary. But there are actually some wonderful things such as fab racing who do children's races. And there's some great kids that have come out of that that are now competing at BSB um, support races. Wow. So I think being a parent must be the hardest thing in the world anyway, and I, I don't envy you at all. I've got oh, it's an absolutely a nightmare, yeah, apart from the, the racing, it's horrible. Oh, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> it to anyone. Good luck with it all anyway. He's muted, he <laughs> wanted to be muted. <laughs> right, two, two little last questions, because I know no time is precious. Um, you mentioned as we were chatting before we, we came on uh, an anecdote that you had about uh, the Cock of the North at Oliver's Mount. Uh, and I know my mum would definitely want to ask that question, but she won't, so I will. What was it? Okay, so my hero is David Jeffries. I was very fortunate to know him and be a friend of his. I went along to the Cock of the North to watch where he was competing and obviously he was a champion there a lot of the time. I was obviously being known, I was very lucky, I got to stand on one of the, the insides of one of those hairpins with the photographers. Anyway, so the race starts, he is leading from the word go. Every time he came around the hairpin, his hand came off the handlebar. Every lap, every lap it came off and I, I was like, what is he doing? Anyway, he, he won the race. I was back in the paddock, wandering through the paddock, bumped into him and he said, Maria, what the hell were you playing at? I waved at you every lap and you never waved back. <laughs> Honest truth, that boy had just so much bike skill that he could wave at me and win the race every lap. So, you know, and I got really told off for not waving back. <laughs> that was amazing. And we're going to finish with the final question goes to Matt. Oh. Oh. Hi, Maria. How are you? Hello. Now, Matt helps me. Uh, he's one of the part of the team that I, I ride a classic bike for at the Max Robbery and I haven't seen Matt for ages. And oh. Just one, Maria. Who's the best mechanic you work with? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we knew this was good. Well, there's a Welsh guy called... <laughs> good to see you, mate. Good to see you. Hopefully, hopefully we get to do something this year. And Definitely. I've been in touch with Steve Caffin, who you work for and who I ride for. He, he was a racer in his day and both... And he raced sidecars as well. And he's been sending me photographs of a sidecar he's rebuilding. And we've been talking about that. So, but um, yeah, hopefully we get to go racing this year at some point. Good to see you, mate. And he said, look out for Samaria. Take care. Well, he's even got his team wear on. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. What a, what a great place to finish up with. That's that's been absolutely brilliant. There's been so many smiles on screen tonight. I knew it was going to be a good one. Um, it really has been. Um, normally when we wrap up, uh, I give a top tip of a website to, to maybe check out around mental health. But, but tonight, um, it's a little different one, this. Because um, I think it, it has been a, a pretty rubbish week and a really tough lockdown. And actually, Jim, who, who's on... Uh, most weeks watching um, he was a massive support to me whilst I was really struggling uh, with my mental health uh, and depression and Jim kept emailing me um, and he would sign off every email with the following and I think it's just a really great way of getting in touch with a mate who if you think there might be be struggling but you're not quite sure what to say um don't be afraid to to contact people if you do think they might be having a bad time but a really good way to sign off is 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 really simple and jim used this every single time and it's something I, I pass on to everyone and just say 
at the end of your email, please don't feel any obligation to reply to this. I know how difficult it can be to deal with things when your mind isn't right, and I wouldn't want you to feel any pressure. And I think that's just a fantastic way of messaging people. Um, it, it worked with me great. The chances are, even if you don't get a reply from someone, they will have probably read the message and they'll have probably read it more than once. And when the time's right, they will get in touch with you. So that, that's my top tip for tonight. Um, and I, I just want to say thanks to, to Maria and to everyone because you've definitely made my day a hell of a lot better than it was. Uh, but I shall hand over to the professional presenter to, uh, to wrap up the show. So, uh, oh, that's you, Paul. Is that me? Yeah. yeah I was going to say, it's either like you or Chris Hosey. <laughs> Actually, do you know, I'll just say my little bit. I'll take 30 seconds, 20 seconds. It's been amazing. Um, I've had, uh, I've had, this has been, I reckon, Tony, this has been the best one we've done yet. We've had the most people, we've had the most questions, we've had the most smiles, and it's it's been really, really cool. I've, you know, loved it up to now. Long may it continue. Um, everybody have a look out for who we're going to have on next. Um, not even thought about it yet, have we, Tony? But Maria, I, can't, I cannot thank you enough. You know, I know people have got better things to do than be questioned by Tony about <laughs> racing. No, joking. Um, <laughs> People have got, <clears throat> it's, it's precious, the t people's time is precious. Um, and I just think it's fantastic that yourself, somebody of your calibre um, and a very well-respected well sports person comes on and, and, um, and gives, gives your time. So I want to thank you on, on behalf of everybody. Um, and I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that. But guys, as usual, I've been Paul O'Neill. He's been Tony. She's been Maria. You've been awesome. I think what we'll do is I'm going to video the bye and I want everybody to wave so good night god bless you all soon thank you so much thank you